Well, we just got our clearest evidence yet that Americans are being censored and manipulated at the highest levels of government. One of the most, I think, one of the most disturbing and eye-opening interviews I've ever seen took place this weekend. I've had to watch it now three times. Four, if you count the amount of times that I've to clip sound bites for this show, really. Um, we're going to show you a bunch of key moments from this interview that Tucker Carlson conducted with a man by the name of Michael Benz. Now, Benz worked, uh, worked at the State Department in the cyber, cyber division, and he's been blowing the whistle exactly on how America has essentially become ruled by the Pentagon. I'm going to say that again. America is ruled by the Pentagon, the Defense Department. As we've been warning you here on this show, the military-industrial complex, I mean, Eisenhower warned about it in his going-away address. Too bad it was already too late when he said that at that time. But what they're doing is silencing, censoring Americans who they deem to be a threat of their plans for endless wars and the massive expansion of the military-industrial complex. They don't want you talking badly about their wars, turns out. And they want puppets in government like Joe Biden who will do their bidding who will perpetuate these wars. That's how the machine continues to operate. What we learned in this interview is deeply disturbing, and it aligns with many of the stories of censorship that we've revealed here on this show. As Natalie just said a moment ago, we've talked about a lot of these things, certainly in the Twitter files and other pieces of censorship content that we've covered here on the show. It all aligns with that. But I think this is the biggest, most comprehensive um, education about all of this that we've heard. Ben's sort of sets the stage by explaining how basically the United States government was blindsided, blindsided by the power of social media and how at first it was seen as a good thing, a way to prop up democracy, free speech. So they really championed social media. Watch. In 2011, 2012, when you had this one by one, all of the adversary governments of the Obama administration Egypt, Tunisia, all began to be toppled in Facebook revolutions and Twitter revolutions. And you had the State Department working very closely with the social media companies to be able to keep social media online during those periods. There was a famous phone call from Google's Jared Cohen to Twitter to uh, not do their scheduled maintenance so that, uh, dis so that the preferred opposition group in Iran would be able to use Twitter uh, to, uh, to, to win that election. So it was an free speech was an instrument of statecraft from the national security state to begin with. All of that architecture, all the NGOs, the relationships between the tech companies and the national security state had been long established for freedom. So just think about that for a moment. The United States was going out of its way to make sure that these people had unfettered access to social media, to make sure that they were free from censorship that they could tell the truth what was happening in their own country. I remember this. I remember this explicitly. I was on the air at Fox and Friends on Fox News Channel during the Arab Spring watching those amazing protests unfold. And one way we were able to get accurate information was from citizen journalists who were there on the ground as those governments were being toppled. So we were getting real-time information where newsrooms like these legacy media really couldn't get any information. So it, they, it enabled them in many ways to topple governments, to get their, no, their voices out, power to the people, essentially. But then Benz explains how the United States-backed coup in Ukraine changed everything. Um, and so just some context here, of course, the United States, you know, Viktor Yanukovych, of course, was, was elected democratically. And then the United States, of course, comes in and... Uh, foments a coup in Ukraine in 2014, right? And installs our own Western puppet, puppet government into Ukraine. Well, just so you understand what happened in Crimea at the time, well, then the ethnic Russians and the heavily ethnic Russian population in Crimea said, wait a second, we do not want this Western government representing us, this NATO-backed U.S. Western government that's anti-Russian and is pro-NATO, pro-U.S. They don't represent us. So we're going to join Russia. We're going to join the Russian Federation um, after the vote was held. And they voted overwhelmingly to become part of Russia. Of course, the West doesn't want you to know that part of the story. That's where Michael says everything went wrong for this plan. Now the social media, the power of social media actually led them to joining Russia. That can't, we can't have that happening on our watch. Imagine what a 
big baby feels like when you can't control other people's countries and outcomes. That you're seeing That's here in Crimea. exactly how Obama acted. Like, wait a minute. They chose for themselves. They chose, can't have this. They chose to join Russia, not the puppet government that we just installed through our CIA uh, our That CIA really coup? backfired. Cannot have it. So here's what Michael Ben says about that. In 2014, after the coup in Ukraine, there was an unexpected counter coup where Crimea and the Donbass broke away. And they broke away with essentially a military backstop that NATO was highly unprepared for at the time. They had one last Hail Mary chance, which was the Crimea annexation vote on, uh, in, in 2014. Uh, and when the hearts and minds of the people of Crimea voted uh, to join the Russian Federation, that was the last straw for the concept of free speech on the Internet in the eyes of NATO. That was it, right? And this is where stuff gets really crazy. Then comes Russiagate and the fake idea that Russia hacked our election and gave power to Trump. They built these spying tools, these censorship techniques to use against these foreign players. But after Russiagate collapsed and Trump fired all of these guys, they got together and essentially turned those tools away from the Russiagate story and from foreign adversaries towards the American people. Listen. It was only after Russiagate died in, uh, in July 2019 when Robert Mueller basically choked on the stand for three hours and revealed he had absolutely nothing after two and a half years of investigation that the foreign to domestic switcheroo took place where they took all of this censorship architecture spanning DHS, the FBI, the CIA, the DOD, the DOJ, and then the thousands of government-funded NGO and private sector mercenary firms were all basically transited from a foreign folk, from a foreign predicate, a Russian disinformation predicate, to a democracy predicate by saying that disinformation is not just a threat when it comes from the Russians, it's actually an intrinsic threat to democracy itself. Okay. I mean, it's unbelievable. So now we're going to turn it now. Now, you know, we're going to turn it on the American people because they didn't see the size of the Internet coming. They didn't see the power of the Internet coming. They didn't see the power of social media coming. It's amazing to me. And I mean, I guess Bill Gates didn't see the Internet either. Right? Well, Microsoft it's not so didn't. much that it's that they didn't see the fact that they couldn't control it. They arrogantly thought that they could continue to control the narrative in the same way that they control the mainstream media. He talks about, do you have this in your clips about CBS and the New York Times? Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so the problem is not that people are speaking for themselves because speaking out loud yeah. in a room is fine. Um, but they'd been so they'd been so conditioned to controlling the spin on all stories that they wanted through the mainstream media. Well, and it's the size of it's the power of, yeah, the legacy media. It's the New York Times. It's the Washington Post. It's these newsrooms that they've infiltrated for years. Operation Mockingbird, and the CIA control mm -hmm. of these of these legacy media. And he explains how they've been fully their mouthpieces of the government. They have been. I mean, the history of The New York Times with the CIA is long and deep. So is CBS News, right? We know that. So when they're like, we're, we're the most trusted name in news. No, you're not. You're mouthpieces of the intelligence state. You're mouthpieces of the government. So they didn't see the size of the Internet coming, the scope of what social media would become. I guess at the time, you know, things like MySpace weren't even around. These little like piddly social media pages. Oh, someone has 20 followers. Big deal. Who cares about your little Facebook page and what you're doing on your father's birthday party or whatever? Who cares, right? They didn't foresee the size that some of these things could take on. Like, I mean, just look at the size of like Tucker's audience, right? Tens of millions of people. So that's a powerful, powerful uh, block. And you had this moment where the elites were worried. They said, hey, what if the New York Times, which tells us all what to think, suddenly declines? This, for me, was one of the most eye-opening pieces of this entire interview. Watch this idea of this tabletop exercise. Like, what about the New York Times, which we control, what if suddenly no one's reading the New York Times anymore and it's about the size of a small Facebook page? Watch. The, the German Marshall Fund held a meeting in 2019. They held a million of these, frankly. But where, they, where a four-star general uh, got up on the panel and, and said that, uh, that the, what happens, he posed the question, what happens to the, to the U.S. military? What happens to the national security state? 
when the New York Times is reduced to a medium-sized Facebook page. And he posed this thought experiment as an example of of we've had these gatekeepers, we've had these bumper cars on democracy in the form of a, of a century-old relationship with legacy media. So I just, I'm blown away by that. Is it bad that I got a little excited about the idea? Of no, the did you see Tucker's face too? Because he's like, hmm, what is it? Because you, you have to think about the New York Times, the Washington Post, these publications. I mean, the LA Times is laying off hundreds of people, right? Because no one's, you know, no one's reading them in the way that they were, were before. And you have to think that many of them were probably artificially propped up. Yes. Right? That I, I would love yeah, to know the full circulation I mean, numbers of the New York Times, right? There's got to be scary for them for, you know, like shows like this where we don't have, you know, like, hey, we're bringing in, uh, you know, like a former Raytheon uh, executive to talk about war in Ukraine. You know, it's like because we're not doing that, you know, it's like they can't control it. They can't control the narrative and even make it look like they're not controlling the narrive, you know? Right. So it's, it's got to be frightening for, and we for, won't that, do for it. that complex. But so, yeah. Yeah, yeah we won't we do that. Do um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to name names, but there are certain legacy media that have offered us money at sponsorship. And we won't do it we, because we can't in good conscience promote some something that we know tells lies. Um, so... You know, we've had two, sort of, I won't say the names, but we've had two legacy media companies reach out to us to sponsor our show. And I, I saw I laughed. I laughed out loud. I'm like, do you know who we are? I would never, ever allow you to be a sponsor on our show. Like, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Two totally separate companies wanted to sponsor our show here at Redacted. Like, no way. Companies that we have pointed out their lies before. So it would be disingenuous of us to take their money. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, anyway, yeah. we won't name names but anyway. So then, so then Trump wins the election and then this happens. When Trump won the election in 2016, um, uh, everyone who worked at the state department, uh, was expecting these promotions to the, to the white house national security council under Hillary Clinton, who I should remind, uh, viewers, you know, was also Secretary of State under Obama, actually ran the State Department. But these folks were all expecting promotions on November 18th, November 8th, 2016, and were unceremoniously uh, put out of jobs by a guy who was a 20 to 1 underdog, according to the New York Times, the day of the election. So then Trump wins. And when Trump won, all of these guys who worked for the Obama administration in the sanctions department, that's basically what they did, operated like sanctions within the State Department, took their skills then to Europe and really got the European Union, pressured them into a series of censorship tools where social media companies under the EU law would then be fined tens of millions of dollars if, say, someone posted something, quote unquote, hateful on their platform. They then could be fined 10, 50, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars per post because of the hate post that somebody on their platform made. So now these social media companies through these European laws were forced to change and they could mass censor all of these posts in Europe. And that's what these that's what this group of Obama, uh, you know, um, people did. And now then once that happened, they were able to take, you know, shadow ban accounts, block tens of thousands of accounts and then bring those things back to the United States. Um, if they don't want unfavorable topics being out there, uh, 2020 election, uh, masks, mandates, COVID, Dr. Fauci, posts about any of that, banned, blocked, hidden, suppressed, and censored. Listen. And this was, a, this gave, you know, I call these weapons of mass deletion. These are essentially the ability to censor tens of millions of posts. With just a few lines of code, they created these, these COVID lexicons of what dissident groups were saying about mandates, about masks, about vaccines, about high profile individuals like Tony Fauci. And then they plugged these into these essentially machine learning models to be able to have a constant world heat map of what everybody was saying about COVID. And whenever something started to trend that was bad for what the Pentagon wanted or was bad for what Tony Fauci wanted, they were able to take down tens of millions of posts. They did this in the 2020 election with mail-in ballots. It was the wait, same Wait, 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 may I ask you, wait, wait, I, I'm sorry, I just got to have to, there's, there's so much here and it's so shocking. So you're saying the Pentagon, our Pentagon, the U.S. Department of Defense censored Americans during the 2020 election? 
cycle? Yes, they did this. They, oh, they did this through the so so there's the two most censored events in human history, I would argue to date, are the 2020 election and the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, two things, two things you can still not freely talk about on YouTube. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're Those on Rumble. We're things. streaming live on Rumble. We can talk there about it. But literally in their terms of service to this day, you still can't talk about that on their platform. Isn't that amazing? Like, it's still there for anyone to go and read. Right now, you can read it if you want. Go read their community guidelines. See it for yourself. It's right there. So now they've used social media to comment about the election. If you use the social media to comment about the election, you could now be considered a cyber be considered a cyber attack on America. That's literally what they're saying here. Listen. Cyber, they said mis, dis, and malinformation online are a form of cybersecurity attack. They are a cyber attack because they are happening online. And they said, well, actually, Russian disinformation is, we're, we're actually protecting democracy in elections. We don't need a Russian predicate after Russiagate died. So just like that, you had this cybersecurity agency be able to legally make the argument that your tweets about mail-in ballots, if you undermine public faith and confidence in them as a legitimate form of voting, was now, you were now conducting a cyber attack on U.S. critical infrastructure by, by articulating misinformation on Twitter. And just like that, now what they did then is they Wait, then so in other words, a bunch of... Com see it. Complaining about election fraud is the same as taking down our power grid. Yes, you could literally be on your toilet seat at 930 on, on a Thursday night and tweet, I think that mail-in ballots are illegitimate. And you were essentially then caught up in the crosshairs of the Department <laughs> of Homeland Security classifying you as conducting a cyber attack on U.S. critical infrastructure because you were doing misinformation online in the cyber realm. And misinformation is a cyber attack on democracy when it undermines public faith and confidence in in our democratic elections and our democratic institutions. Unbelievable. I've got two more to show you here. Just two more. Someone in our chat, Phil DeGora, says, I'm a former U.S. Marine. This is not what I fought for or signed up for. Yeah. I think a lot of people are having this thought right now about what does it mean? What is the United States anymore? And that we're paying for them to do this to us. Right. We're paying for them to torture us. Because this is a nightmare. Watching this is absolutely a nightmare. Um, the fact that they classified the media as a tenet of the state. So if you are questioning the media, not only mail-in ballots, but if you're questioning the media, you could also be accused of being disruptive of government right. services. So they're basically admitting that the right. media is an arm of the government. Right. Um, yeah, it's a dystopian nightmare. Absolutely a dystopian nightmare. But I mean, you know, someone just in our chat pointed out that the Tucker Carlson interview with Vladimir Putin has how many billions of views now? That for them is a nightmare, a nightmare that they can't control, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah, but now this is when we come back to desperate people do desperate things, right? Because now they're having, I mean, they tried, they tried to go after Tucker Carlson before his interview with, uh, with Vladimir Putin. The NSA was spying on him. Uh, broke into his phone before. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? <laughs> He's a journalist. And you have the government is breaking into his phone before he goes to Moscow to interview president of Russia. Really? Um, it, it's unbelievable to me. And, but this is now they're scared. So desperate people do desperate things. What are they going to do? That's what's really scary because now people have, you know, and we have a, a platform like X for all of its imperfections. And I don't know all of its imperfections, this we're able to actually play this interview and talk about it because it was published on X. So anyway, they censored hundreds of millions of posts and they did it seven months before the election. They knew exactly that Biden was going to win the election. This is the most important part, I think, that maybe of this entire interview is that they, you know, using mail in ballots. They were trying to prevent people from talking about it, and they knew it seven months ahead of time. Listen. And mind you, they did this on 15 platforms. So this is hundreds of millions of posts, which were all scanned and banned or throttled so that they could not be amplified or they exist in a sort of limited state purgatory. 
or had these frictions affixed to them in the form of fact-checking labels where you couldn't actually click through to the thing or you had to, it was, it was an inconvenience to be able to share it. Now, they did this seven months before the election because at the time they, they were worried about the perceived legitimacy of a Biden victory in the case of a so-called red mirage blue shift event. They, they knew the only way that Biden would be able to, was, would win mathematically uh, was through the disproportionate Democrat use of mail-in ballots. They knew there would be a crisis because it was going to look extremely weird if, if Trump looked like he won by seven states. In November, you know, uh, and then three days later, it comes out, actually, the election switch. I mean, that, that would put the election crisis of the Bush-Gore election uh, on a level of steroids that the national security state said, well, the, the, the public will not be prepared for. So what we need to do is we need to, in advance, we need to pre-censor the ability to even question the legitimacy. This took out. Wait, wait. May, may I ask you to pause right there? Key so, by so what you're mm-hmm. saying is, what you're suggesting is, they knew the outcome of the election seven months before it was held. It looks very bad. Certainly, what they did. <laughs> yes, is... it, yes, Mike. It does look very bad. <laughs> <laughs> it looks very bad. Yes, indeed. So they knew ahead of time what was going to happen, and they were then making sure to suppress any consternation about it. Online, anywhere. They knew how this was going to unfold Mm -hmm. seven months ahead of time. They knew exactly how the election would play out. Yes, that's very surprising. I mean, what do we call this? You know, this is illegal. Yeah. And and he points out it's the perfect crime, really, because the the, the very people responsible for Trump's impeachment in the Russia hoax were behind this new form of censorship. I mean, it's unbelievable. The military industrial complex, the censorship industrial complex, one and the same. Um, and, you know, he, he sort of levels it off at the end here to say that this is not a democracy. I mean, the U.S. is basically ruled by the, U, the military industrial complex. You're not describing democracy. I mean, you're describing a country in which democracy is impossible. What I'm essentially describing is military rule. Yeah, military rule. Let us know what you think about this in the comments below. I think it's one of the most disturbing interviews. I, you know, we'll link it up in the description. I think it's. I would encourage all of you to go watch it uh, while it's available on YouTube. I can't believe that it's still available on YouTube. That interview. I think it just would be. I guess if you if you're YouTube, you probably look at that video. You're like, oh my god, there's a lot of things that we don't allow said in our terms of service. But if we take this video down, we at YouTube are going to look really stupid. Yeah, we're going to be literally. Well, censoring but, a video about censorship, <laughs> which so, they do all the time. I know, but this happily is the size, to us, they'll, they'll the probably still do it. They'll yeah. probably still do it after it's run its advertising course, and <laughs> right, then they'll pull they it. Their, yeah, they make their money on it. Yeah, right. uh, unbelievable here. And I think Mike, uh, we've invited Mike on the show. Who I'm going to talk to. I want to dive more deeply into some of these specific topics here. Pull threads a little bit more uh, closely here, and, and ask uh, some more, uh, you know, deeper dive questions on on some key points that he pointed out when this hour long interview with Tucker. So bravo to them for doing this interview. Again, one of the most disturbing and thoughtful interviews I've, I maybe I've ever seen. So I encourage all of you to go and watch it. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment, let us know what you think about it and we will see you next time, everyone.